Hi, and welcome to the 12th House Podcast, where we make the unseen seen. I'm Michelle, the CEO and head witch in charge at Holisticism, and I'm so happy that you're here. Oh, what a time. It is almost 2021. We've got like two weeks left in the year. Man, if you needed evidence that time is simply a human construct slash a flat circle, <laughs> I present to you 2020. Man, oh man, I feel like the time has like been simultaneously going so fast and also moving at a glacial speed. And I don't know what to do with it, but I'm also okay with it. I kind of like unpopular opinion. I like this time of year. I don't like love the holidays necessarily, but I just like the feeling that we're getting to the end. It feels like, you know, when you, you get to the end of a book, remember when we used to read books, like actual paper books, you could feel the weight of like all hundreds of pages in your left hand because you were getting to the very end of the book. And there's just something so rewarding about that, feeling it like, you know, tactilely between your fingers. That's how this time of year feels. <laughs> I know that is a little abstract, but that's how it feels for me. It feels like, whoa, there's so much weight behind me and I'm almost at the finish line and now I get to start open the page on a new book. But I also love this time of year because if I've done my job well, <laughs> it's easy, like it's fun. If I've done a good job and I've like kept my shit tight for the rest of the year in my work, then I'm not scrambling at the last minute. Even like quarter four can be a fun quarter where we just enjoy ourselves and it's all gravy and everything else that we do is like sort of added extra bonus. I really appreciate that. I like having fun. Shocker. I also think like your work should be fun and it shouldn't feel stressful. And I don't think the end of the year should feel like you're diving to make certain numbers or to make things happen. I actually really love what we're putting out right now on holisticism. We've really had our eyes for a couple of weeks on creating content and creating opportunities for you, our listeners or our community to start setting up the vision for what they want 2021 to look like. You know, to me, the worst feeling ever is waking up on January 1st of a new year and being like, God damn it, I have to write goals. I have to like think about what I want to do with my life and I'm hungover or or I don't want to or I only have one more day of Christmas break or whatever it may be, holiday break. I don't like that feeling because I feel like I'm already behind. And the anxious person inside of me like really, really hates that. And the overachiever slash like wise version of me who can sometimes be an overachiever, but honestly, it's just like more chill and cool. Like when I've envisioned my higher self, it's this person. She like has really nice hair. That's kind of just like air dried. And she's like super chill and casual. And she's just like laughing at me having anxiety, but in a nice way, like, Oh, you sweet baby angel. <laughs> Why are you stressed about that? You know, she's just cool. I really like future me <laughs> or highest level version of me. Hope I get to be her one day. Cross your fingers. When I think about like future me, she's the type of person who starts thinking about what she wants her life to look like. Not at the last minute, not as like it's happening already. If we think about our, our new year happening on the first day of the year, she's someone who's actually had just gotten the time to sit with it maybe maybe to like try on what something could look or feel like, perhaps even given herself the luxury of changing her mind. I don't know, crazy. And trying on different ideas, trying on different dreams and feeling into what feels right. For me, I'm like, I need my ideas to age. I'm an emotional projector. I need to sleep on things. I need to like let them simmer and brew before I'm like, yeah, okay, that's good. Usually my first idea is not my best idea. Some people are like, oh yeah, first idea, best idea. No, 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 not for Pelazon. My first idea is bad. I'm just going to say it. I need time to like sort of sit with my thoughts and let them age like a fine wine. So it's all to say, I buried the lead here, but that's all to say that over the last couple of weeks and, and moving into the last part of 2020, everything that we've set up in terms of content for, for you, for our community is about getting really clear on what you want 2021 to look like, either for your intuitive business or if you are a 
future intuitive business owner or aspiring intuitive business owner, getting you set up to maybe make the leap into starting your business next year. If you're a creator or an innovator, thinking about what that year could look like for you and the different aspects, you know, we're looking at the four pillars of intuitive business, growth, revenue, retention, impact, and what do all those areas of your life look and feel like? And which ones excite you the most? What can you create? What magic can you procure in those areas of your life and in your work? And so we've made a lot of content around that. And I have also taught a bunch of classes. And if you missed my first two classes, I'm teaching a series of four classes for free. I love teaching. It's my favorite, most favorite thing on planet. I got the teacher archetype. What can I say? And so every opportunity that I get to teach a free class, like I'm super there. So I've been teaching class every Tuesday, starting on December 1st. Our last two classes were on growth and revenue. So how to build more growth in your audience or your community in your work for next year and to set up your goals for that and how to do that, how to actually facilitate growth. And then last week we talked about revenue or resource. So when we look at the money that we're making or how we are resourced, because it doesn't have to necessarily be cash money, but cash money is cool. Where does that come from? How do we set ourselves up for that? How do we plan for it as opposed to crossing our fingers and hoping that money drops into our lap, which sometimes works, but not always. So we've got two more classes that I'm teaching on retention and impact. Our next class is actually today, the day that this podcast goes live on Tuesday, December 15th. And class is at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And I'll be talking about retention and how to really nourish your community and pour back into your community or pour back into yourself because that's so, so important. What's going to keep us going? Because we're here for the long haul, right? So retention is all about longevity. And that is to me the opposite of like toxic capitalism. (laughs) Retention is about regeneration. So we're going to talk about retention in today's class. I hope you can join me. You can sign up for class at holisticism.com backslash workshops. Class is free. And if you can't join live, that's okay. Just sign up for class anyways, and I'll send you the replay. I just want everyone to get this stuff because it's more important to me that you have it and that you're able to use it if you want to. And if you just walk away with one thing that helps you make 2021 the best year of your life, the best year of your business, or at least pushes you in that direction, then to me, that is worth it. And then next week on December 22nd, I'm teaching a class on impact. And that will be our final class of the year. I'm, I cannot believe it. So impact, a pillar of intuitive business is most people that <laughs> most people avoid, to be totally honest with you. We can sort of like put our blinders on when it comes to retention and impact in our businesses. We tend to focus on growth and revenue because like that makes sense. It's what we can see. Retention and impact are sort of the things underneath the iceberg, under the water, I should say, on the iceberg that are so much more important where like all the the juicy weightiness of the work that you do is but are unseen. So we tend to avoid them or forget about these aspects of our work. So I'm talking about retention today. And in next week's class, I'm talking about impact and how to build impact goals or an impact focus into the work that you do. Because when you have that sort of high level focus, it makes you want to show up every single day because you have a greater purpose than just making money or getting famous or whatever it is that you maybe like sort of primarily want right now. I can just tell you when things get hard, you got to have a lot more on the line than just money or like people knowing your name. There needs to be something greater, something bigger, at least for me. And so I think that building in impact and orienting around impact in your work can be really, really valuable for inspiring you to, to keep showing up and to dream bigger. Because when it's not just you on the line or your team, when your impact and how well your business does can change the lives of hundreds or thousands of people, that's a lot more inspiring. And that lights a fire underneath you. And there's energy behind that. You know, I really believe that there are the energetics, the sort of magic behind a business, the velocity behind a business has a lot to do with the impact and the the purpose and the sort of like the heart that's there. 
So I'm excited to teach all those classes. I really hope that you join. I love meeting you in class and getting to talk to you and answering your questions and learning from you. I learn so much every single time I teach. So go sign up holisticism.com backslash workshops. And I think that's it for what's on our docket. We're opening the doors to the North node in just a couple of weeks, which is crazy. We only open the doors twice a year and I can't believe it's already that time again. So if you want to learn more about that, you can just go to holisticism.com backslash North dash node. The North node is our private members community for intuitive entrepreneurs. We have about, gosh, 300 amazing human beings in there right now. And it's my favorite thing. It's my most favorite thing. I love to spend time with that that crew of people. They are endlessly inspiring and just making the coolest shit. So if you're curious, I'm sure you're going to hear more about it in the next couple of weeks, but you can go find more at holisticism.com backslash north dash node. And with that, let's get into today's episode. I am so honored that I got to talk to Satara. Satara is a conjure doctor. She's a musician. She's just an amazing human being. You're going to be obsessed with her. Mark my words. This woman is, she's already famous in my eyes, but she is one. Keep your eye on her. She is really going to make an impact in a very real way in the spiritual space, in the wellness space. In I wouldn't be surprised if she's like winning a Grammy in two years slash like doing the most amazing work, conjure work still. So keep your eye on her because she's incredible. And I'm so excited for this conversation. We went all over the place. We talked for like two and a half hours about everything. So we tried to cut it down to make it a a more reasonable amount of time. (laughs) But if you can't tell already, or you don't, you can't tell from the conversation. I'm obsessed with her. And I can't wait for you to learn more about Satara. So without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. Satara, welcome to the 12th House Podcast. I'm so excited to have you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So before we jump in, can you give us like a 30 second elevator pitch of who you are and what you do? Yes, I am a black girl who heals people. That's like the way that I've come to it thus far. But I'm a conjure doctor and a musician. So I make art and conjure work. So I work with the dead. I'm a medium. I do personal coaching. And of course, I divine. So I'll throw dice or cards for people to see what's up and make prescription play shows when shows were allowed <laughs> tbt yeah. that's where we we met at a dive in at the dive yes. in Hall dinner and you played your music and you were amazing and i was like i love her and i'm so excited that i get to talk to you today on the podcast and you came and you taught a class for our north node community which was amazing about conjure and so many other like every single thing you said was basically like a tweetable like Mm. you you, like it was so quotable and so (laughs) just like delightful so I'm really excited to have you here yay okay so part of your story when I was thinking about how you came to the realization that you're a conjure doctor I was like that really sounds like the archetypal journey Mm -hmm. of a healer right like facing death basically yeah can like tell me more about this and have you thought about it and did you realize that this was going to be your sort of like entry into doing what you do I mean honestly I just feel that it was so so dramatic like that's my biggest (laughs) beef about this whole (laughs) issue and like I am a dramatic person so it makes sense that my entry into the spiritual world would be that way but it reminds me of like one of my favorite characters like where we talk about who doing conjure everything wasn't excellent but this piece was is a Lafayette in True Blood being like Mm -hmm. this queer black line cook and he's defining with playing cards at one point he goes y'all don't have to be so cryptic about the spirit world (laughs) And so, like, part of me that's, like, very seated in my ego would be, like, you could have just told me, but the reality (laughs) is they probably could not have, because I knew already, you know, like. I was going to say, like, would you have listened? (laughs) Probably not. And also, you know, it's interesting because when we talk about this, like, archetypical journey of the healer, for sure, like, as I look at my life, and especially as I, like, come into community with other spiritualists, I find that, like, they share those stories. I guess the frustration that I have around it is like, 
there can be like an uplifting of suffering. And I know in my case, some of the suffering that I went through was because people be haters for real, like on spiritual mm -hmm. attack, on like negative energy. And those are facts of life. Yeah. But I'm wondering like how, I just wonder how the story is told often because I'm thinking about my own experience. Then I look back at these other like healer stories and I'm like, but how are your protection works? You know what I mean? Like, were you in community with people? Because mm -hmm. some of it is that yes, you have to become comfortable with like death as a reality. Even I feel like as gifted as I may have been as a child, I wasn't confident. And I feel that so much of my confidence came. But like mm -hmm. now I've realized, I'd be like, man, a lot of stuff might kill me, but it won't be y'all. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like I gather like something may kill me, but it won't be y'all people. So why am I afraid? But it mm -hmm. took a little bit. It probably took that for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like facing down death and realizing how strong you were and how powerful mm -hmm. you were. Yeah. How powerful I was. And also like, if death is going to happen, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And like death is a transition, especially in the frameworks within, within where I work. Like death is a transition to a whole nother life and a whole nother set of responsibilities. And being someone that works so closely with the dead, I think that I needed to see death so that I could live my life actively because I think I had been living very autopilot and I think mm -hmm. other people who looked at me wouldn't have thought that because I did so yeah. much and I've always done so much but I don't think I was really living for me I was living for the people who I loved mm. that's so interesting because I you're an artist and I think you went to grad school mm -hmm. for to be an artist right mm -hmm. and so many people would probably say, oh yeah, that's living the dream. That's living life fully, you know, not going to like business school or like doing a job that kills your soul. But to your point, like there's still, I mean, there's ego in everything, you know, like we're, when we're young, we often want to impress the people that we love or like, mm, I don't know, perform for them, like help them live vicariously through us. And it can look like going to business school and like, you know, selling out to, I don't know, and being an eye banker, but it also can look like the path of an artist or an alternative path. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think it's, it is very contextual. And I think that I had so much guilt and I didn't speak about how unhappy I was in a lot of spaces mm. because there was this feeling of who are you to be unsatisfied? Ooh, you see what I'm yeah. saying? When you are yeah. living your dream, especially for me. So like my context I'm the oldest daughter, was the only child for a long time of my mother and the oldest girl of my father. My parents are not mm -hmm. together. Most of them are brilliant and they're probably better off not together. <laughs> so <laughs> it didn't really bother me much growing up. You're like, cool, keep doing that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If anything, I have my individual beef with them now as parents. You feel me? Like my beef <laughs> with my mom. I don't have like parental oh, yeah. beef as a unit. I have like, and then you tried me this one time and I <laughs> Yeah, that's like, that's the healthy, like, parental beef when you're like, no, both of you suck. Yeah, individually. exactly. Individually, <laughs> both of you are tripping. You know, they're both <laughs> awesome, but they both have their things. But, you know, realistically, I'm the first person in my immediate lineage to have cousins with a higher education degree. Neither of my parents wow. graduated from college. My mother had me at 18. My father was 21. My mother owned a hair salon at 16. So my mom has been doing hair, even though my mom was a very gifted spiritualist and very gifted medium. I think being afraid of her gifts, along with having me, my mom had me so young that like mm -hmm. she put everything, including the ability to be an openly spiritual person, like the space that maybe no one created for her. She really cultivated that for me. I was talking online the other day and was like any metaphysical thing that you could have done. I mean, I did landmark at like 16. Like, oh, wait. Okay. Which is yes. Let's talk a whole about landmark. Thing. Yeah. So wait, no, no, no. I want to go down this. It's a we'll whole rabbit up. hole. Give me your hot take on, on landmark, landmark forum. You better stop before they come kill me like the Scientologists. <laughs> but like I said, it's not. <laughs> or Nexium, <laughs> man. <laughs> I, I just, you know, I think that it's a very interesting space because in some ways, people who are so, so tied to their trauma, which as a practitioner, I've seen. Mm -hmm. Like as a practitioner, I have seen people who are so tied to the narrative of their trauma. And so I can understand landmark form on their emphasis of like not being beholden to the experiences that have happened to you. 
However, right. it just Get out feels, of your story. But it feels really privileged to me. Mm-hmm. It just feels like a seat from which a lot of people don't have the room to look. And then in terms of infrastructure wise, I mean, like somebody paid for me to go. I want to say like a friend of my mother's or maybe, you know, something happened where we got to go. But I just feel that the way that they build community feels kind of capitalist and weird to me. And an I'm not into that. Yeah. And so like, <laughs> I was happy to just kind of go and see if anything, what I observed is that there are a lot of very talented, like mediums and spiritualists who are just looking for a place to be. And so those places mm. for me were mostly just like looking at a bunch of like psychic people and being like, this is what happens when you, I mean, I feel the same way about a lot of metaphysical things and a lot of things that are happening. Like we've talked about human design and I love human design, but also I cannot forget that this is some white dude who just like saw shit that people of color have been seeing for years and put it in a book and now it's everywhere. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's su- and who's also like super problematic. Yeah. 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 There's, well, there's like, we can hold both things at the same Absolutely. time. Right. I feel like that's like an F Scott Fitzgerald quote, really brilliant people can hold two truths that seem contradictory. I at the always same time. say that to my clients. I'm like, two things can be true at once. That's very, I'm yeah. Gemini Libra Moon. So like duality oh, yeah. is my bag. So there I'm, you, you know, and it can be quite frustrating for a lot of people. But even in terms of, like, even when I'm working in traditions, because conjure and African-based traditions can look quite binary on the surface, Mm -hmm. they're never inherently binary. It's like, you look Mm -hmm. at a plant, what parts are male, what parts are female, but the whole plant is the plant. So you have to know all of that. It's very much like that. So I'm grateful for all of the experiences I had in spiritual community, whether it was like very, very traditionalist. My mom was Buddhist for a while. No, we had every book we had like the Quran she let me do whatever I wanted to do my mom married a Muslim man yeah my mom's ex-husband now my father's brother is very religious in Senegalese Mm -hmm. and so I can firmly a be comfortable in my tradition and say that they're right for me because I got to dibble dabble around but b I can also be like love and light community with y'all's that's not it y'all are confused Mm -mm. that's confusion Mm -mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The landmark for, um, I got to go to landmark too for free because mm-hmm. I worked at a retail store that mm-hmm. after you worked there for a year, they would send you to landmark and yeah. everyone always quit after, <laughs> which was really interesting. Yeah. It's, there's a lot that it overlooks that it's, it's yeah. a, an avoidance of, and that can really mess up your life if you stay in a, in avoidance in that way. And when yeah. you, I don't know when you when you see things as either or right as opposed to what we're talking about which is like two two things can it can be a yes and but do you feel like when you were growing up and you were experiencing all these different sort of aspects of spirituality did you identify with all of them did you feel like they all resonated or were there some that really powerfully stood out to you both and yeah both (laughs) so I love I love the practice of the black church how that felt like home to me and that makes sense because ancestrally that's my space and as a musician music is such an integral part of how I work with spirit and such an integral spark part of how I move within spirit that the black church always felt like home for me but unfortunately there's this little thing in the bible that says that's why I'm not consort with psychics witches diviners and just like you know mediums and just like having been so very clearly a person who deals with dead people. I remember being like (laughs) five. Uh Like my grandmother used to let me, and everybody knew, but my grandmother like kind of just let me be me. Like we would go to church at my great grandmother's church, Cane and Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio. And sorry to, well, the old pastor not there no more. So he don't even know. (laughs) But my grandma, I used to be reading Harry Potter and she would let me take the cover. Yeah. In church? Yes. Cause I'd be bored. (laughs) I just was there for the music. And so she would tell me, You're like, peg me when the concert starts. For sure. <laughs> I want to, I want to hear praise and worship at the top. I want to hear the soloist. Mm-hmm. And I would listen to the word too, like depending on how it was and what he was saying, but sometimes they would say stuff that just felt so incorrect to me. Mm-hmm. And when something feels incorrect, like cruel or mean, and there's cruelty in the world. I'm, you know, if it's time for that, it's time for that. But it would just feel unnecessary. And Christianity often feels like that to me. So the Black church felt like home, but I was busy reading Harry Potter with the cover off. And they would be like, they would come to my grandma and be like, your grandbaby is so gifted. Like, she's just really in that word. 
She's going to be oh blessed God. and highly favored. Her <laughs> head is in the good book. Do you hear me? And my grandma used to be like, mm -hmm. sure is. And like, I don't know, I was watching a Quidditch match in my head. Like, oh God. So You're church, like literally reading about witchcraft. Literally reading about, which was, you know, like literally reading about witchcraft. Like literally being like, and re reading that and being like, why don't we have this for black people? Like, why is there right. no black people here? Like, I was watching, reading this, like, this would be lit. Like, I knew that I was going to get my letter in the mail. I was just, like, waiting. Like, I had found my people. Why haven't they found me? Right. I'm confused. Oh. You know, so I resonated with church a lot. My mom was Buddhist, and I loved that. I like the act of, like, prayer, especially, like, fervent prayer. It's not, it's funny because I find that I'm a very religious person, even outside of like a religious space. I like to yeah. pray. And so chanting yeah. was really nice. And like chanting Daimoku, I really liked because it was objective. So the concept was like, you could chant for crack cocaine if you want it. Just when you get it, be mm -hmm. ready to deal with the consequences of that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because when I asked my mom recently why she chose Buddhism, they told her that by chanting Daimoku, you could heal your ancestral lineage like seven years back and seven years forward and that mm. was why she chose it so I wow. think you know I come from a lineage of healers and people who are very focused on healing and I just feel that my mother gave me a lot of opportunities to see how people did it and I was just happy to be in the space I was happy to be in healing spaces I'm always happy to be around music spaces which are inherently healing spaces so I kind of felt that none of them were right like I kind of felt that none of them were right, but they were all really good, important information. And I just looked at consistencies, like what is consistent? Also, like as a medium, you know, the presence of spirit. So I can be in a space and be like, oh, like spirit is here. And then I got to go, what spirit, who's and why and what they doing? Whoa, I've never thought about that. So mm -hmm. when you walk into a, a, a church or a synagogue, you feel or you see spirit and like, does that indicate to you, like, if a place is right to you or not? It just indicates to me what kind of energy is being had there and, like, mm -hmm. what it is that they're working around. Because sometimes you walk into a space, for example, and there's a spirit of fear. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily a divinity, but that is the divinity. Or oftentimes you walk into spaces and it's money, <laughs> you know? And so objectively, I just, I, spirit is everywhere and in everything, and you can look at people and see what it is and whom they're dealing with. And you just decide whether or not that resonates with you. Mm -hmm. If you work in a tradition where you have quite active ancestors or a spirit to look out for you, they may remove you from a place that they feel is unfit, right? Or things in your life may not be going a certain way. So I've certainly like had clients who were in the wrong type of spiritual community. And you just go, this is not for you. Wow. And usually they go, I know, but I was just. <laughs> but we want to find our home, right? Like we want to find spirituality mm -hmm. in something. We want to find where we feel at home. And so sometimes we'll try so hard to make, make a round peg fat, fit into a square hole. <laughs> That's not the saying, but, yeah, you know, like we'll try so hard to make it work, even when it's like that ain't it, you know? Well, yeah. And I think that people are like looking for outside guidance. It's a very, especially mm -hmm. like I work in hoodoo, which is an African-American tradition, but inherently at its core, the cosmology, the way that it moves is African, which means it mm -hmm. doesn't sit in a Western framework in the terms of the way that you have to conceive your relationship to things. And so oftentimes people go, I want to learn hoodoo. Where do I read? What book do I read? And don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. It's a whole lot of books, but this is not a tradition <laughs> that's taught through books. And so those books are often not accurate. They're often mm -hmm. written by non-black people, which inherently makes them inaccurate. Right. You know, that's just the reality of that. And so you're always dealing with secondhand information. If that information was even given accurately to begin with because conjure doctors talk in code even amongst each other. We are a closed tradition. Right. So just because you read it in a book, when I say like, first of all, we're an ancestral tradition, but then two, if I'm writing it down, I'm not including everything. Hmm. I'm not. And if I'm telling you about it, I'm not telling you everything. One, because I couldn't. Mm -hmm. You know, like there are things that happen that I couldn't really explain. Yeah. And then two, I wouldn't. <laughs> that's, just, you right. know, that's just on that. I wouldn't because 
I wouldn't. And so, even, you know, so, <laughs> and I know that that's frustrating. I wouldn't because I wouldn't. Yeah, but it makes sense. And like, oh my God, you're missing so much of the nuance and the detail and probably the soul of it if you're just trying to read a book or like take a course on XYZ thing. Like that's not the point. So I guess this, this goes into spiritual conversation, right? On like, the way that I have decided to cope with like crazy shit in my life. So I was in a long-term relationship. I was in like a seven year relationship. So like I met my ex freshman year of college. Yeah. I met my ex freshman year of college and we were just, I'm that girl. And you know what? I hate it. I'm that girl spiritually. Cause after this breakup, I got another divination and they were like, I had been single for maybe six months. Mm Mm-hmm. And I got a divination to be like, why did my relationship not work? And they dead ass were like, you pick someone you weren't compatible with. He wanted to be in the house all the time. You wanted to be outside. It didn't work. I don't know why you was doing that. And I was like, you mean to tell me this is just my codependency issues? First off, rude. Because you know, you want to hear in a reading like there was, this, and there was, I'm not going to just chalk it up to like BS because there's so much that I gained from that relationship. Of course. But a lot of what I gained through that relationship was like based on the shit that I should not have been dealing with that then (laughs) after my relationship, I had to unpack, right? But after that relationship ended, I moved and it was my first time living alone. And it was really what that relationship ended. It'll be two years in February. Congratulations. Thank you. And I remember when people were like, it's going to take you like five years or like half the time or whatever half the time and I just remember being like at the time maybe just because I'm indignant being like no I'm not I'm not gonna take that long and so I did what you do when you're indignant which is like throw yourself into a bunch of weird situations I was gonna say sleep with everyone that's what I did yeah yeah (laughs) except for like I can't inherently sleep with everyone because Mm, I have this thing where like I can sleep with you but only if I know that I don't like you for real Oh, so yeah, was, that's the problem. That's the problem. <laughs> so it was just like a series of bad choices. And I was so stressed out and I was so depressed. And when I was sitting one day, I had to be like, Satara, what is the problem here? Like, what, aside from being single, what's really one issue that you don't like about being by yourself that you could fix? And I was weeping and I was like, I have to make my own coffee. Because oh. someone had made my coffee every year for seven years. Mm. Like wow. whether it was like me going and him buying my coffee or him actually making it when we lived together. It mm-hmm. was just and my mom was always up earlier than me. So like really probably even longer than seven years, having my coffee made for me is like an excellent show of love. And so I bought yeah. myself the automatic coffee alarm clock. <laughs> so now it makes pour over <laughs> when I wake up. Yes. And I spent that money and was like, I love me. Every morning when I wake <sighs> up, it's like, she. And it's just you pour can... over and it's. That's like, oh my God, what a metaphor for like self love and like having your own back and like doing it on your own, you know? How perfect. It was totally worth the money. It was better. And so like, <sighs> this bet. is like what I tell my clients. Like, the spiritual work and like there are shortcuts and I believe in shortcuts. I believe in shortcuts. I don't believe that everything has to be like some we soul love a hack. cringing. We, lo- we, lo- we don't want it to be dramatic all the time. We love a hack. Yeah, but- we love a hack. We love saving energy. We love like knowing yourself, supporting yourself, doing the work and then like letting it go is my favorite, mm-hmm. you know? And knowing that mm-hmm. like, you'll be back to this spot. Like the coffee maker yeah. is not the fix. <laughs> But it does allow me to like have what I need so I can process. Yeah. Whatever else. It's like, it's a little bit like training wheels or something, or like, you know, it gets you to, or like bumpers on a bowling alley. Like it gets you there. It like helps you work up those muscles to like do it on your own or get the bigger lesson. But Mm -hmm. in the meantime, like it's serving. Yeah. And like, it's something that brings me joy. Like you said, Mm -hmm. it's giving me the training wheels to make it myself because I know how to make a good cup of coffee and I love to. Obviously, yeah. But then also, I had to really, when I was saying like, I had been living for everyone else and I felt that I wasn't doing what I wanted to do with my own life. Mm -hmm. I had to really come into the fact that like, I don't owe anybody perfection, nor do Mm -hmm. I have to do everything because I think it has a lot to do with like, I think women in general carry this, but especially Black women, 
Like, mm-hmm. I didn't realize how much I was overdoing. I overdo. Mm-hmm. I do way too much. Mm-hmm. And so even doing less is nerve wracking for me. And the thing that gives me anxiety is that I have done less. Like, mm-hmm. you are the only work thing that I will be doing today. Mm-hmm. And that's on discipline. Because I woke up this morning and was like, what needs to happen? What emails need to be sent? I need to go. And then I was like, but you need to grocery shop and you need to meal prep and you, I have stuff to do, mm-hmm. but doing for myself still feels very, cause like productivity was my bag, right? Like piece of right. car. So she's right. on it. She's that girl. Mm-hmm. And so then me being like, okay, I am that girl, but I also require like other things besides work in my life. And even for me, that was weird. (laughs) Yeah. I love that you said discipline because so many people associate discipline with work, right. Mm -hmm. And like showing up and doing more work or working harder or whatever. And actually it's for many of us, I know that I have lots of codependent tendencies. I also dated someone for like five years uh, all through college. And then the breakup was the worst. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. The worst. (laughs) But like that, like codependent moment or like trying to have it all together and be in control. It takes a lot of discipline to be like, I'm not going to control the situation or like, I'm going to let myself be taken care of by someone else or whatever it is, whatever your mantra is of that day. Mm Mm-hmm. And for me, it's like, is my value in how well I do things, which, you know, Mm -hmm. like is Mm -hmm. doing everything that I put on my to-do list going to be the thing that means I have a good day or a bad day. And COVID has been a challenge, but a gift for me because it's like, what am I doing when no one's looking? Like, I love to cook for people, for example. I love to cook and cooking for other people is like my love language. And so the other Mm -hmm. thing I wasn't doing when I was not making my coffee, I wasn't cooking at all, which was a toll on my health. Yeah, and I, which I was eating out a ton, which is not like mm-hmm. me. Cause if I have a partner, mm-hmm. it's weird, right? Yeah. I don't want them eating outside food. <laughs> that seems <laughs> devastating to me. Like, <laughs> right, right. You need to make, you're like loving them. You're like infusing their food with love every single day, every day. But it yeah. just felt like after my relationship ended, like, why would I be doing that? And now I get so much pleasure in doing that because it's free. And I love to cook, like regardless of anyone else. I like food. I like produce. I like herbs. I like plants. I like, you know, I like Mm -hmm. meat. That's my vibe. You get a good cut of meat. You're like, "Mm." like, thank you, pig. (laughs) You lived a good life. Yeah. Like I'd be grateful. You did good with this one. Yeah. Like this was a life well served. I'm going to process you. And you know, like, this is good. But like, Yeah, it's, are you a projector? Yeah, I am. We're both projectors. Yeah, because the one thing that that dude said, and I remember listening to human design, and like you said, I was like, this dude (laughs) kind of problematic. But then I was like, but he be spitting sometimes. Right, right. (laughs) But he's not wrong in this one case. So I was like, I've I've sent it to a lot of my friends and been like, look, this dude kind of (laughs) racist. But Honestly, when I'm dealing with spiritualists of all traditions, like unfortunately, anti-blackness is very common. So Mm. I've learned to just be like, oh, that's your bullshit. But what else is going on over here? Like, (laughs) like, what are you trying to say? Because you about to be wild. So he was being (laughs) hella wild in one of the episodes. But he said something that like, I had to turn the thing off. I said, don't read me, sir. He was like projectors. (laughs) He was talking about people in like seven year cycles. Uh-huh. And how projectors can be all in the wrong person for seven in like at the end of seven Whoa, years. Oh, that just gave me full body chills. So he dragged me. <laughs> he he was like, everyone moves filth, in seven year cycles. <laughs> He's like, but projectors are most affected by seven year cycles. And mm-hmm. you can see it in their relationship history. He's like, because you will watch a projector be in a long term relationship trying to guide someone somewhere they don't want to go and like, my ex was a generator so definitely getting all of the sacral energy right because uh-huh. I can't do things I mean I can yeah. but I'm not a do things type of bitch yeah. so making my coffee <laughs> like it, ma- it makes a difference do. please <laughs> do the things and I will yeah. love you and I had to really be like that's not all it is though girl like it can't just be that you love the person that's going to do the things because you like as you know it's projector you take so you look at someone and you go you're a mess but I think that I can work with this <laughs> you're a mess but I think but I'll that fix was it. <laughs> yes I like with you you but I can fix you <laughs> that was, that was, that was. I was watching that show and I was like 
I was watching you, the stalker show. And, like, <laughs> and you were relating to it. Yeah, like, yeah, like, I see where he's coming from. <laughs> yeah, because if she would just do what he said. God, Beck, you're yeah. such a generator. <laughs> Your life would be better if you would follow directions, girl. Like, follow directions. And so, like, I remember just having to turn off the episode after that. Because at the end of this, yeah, it was the podcast where the man was talking, talking about seven-year cycles with projectors. And I just had to turn that thing off and lay down because I was like, first of all, <laughs> my your <dream> is it. <laughs> first of all, nobody asked First of all, this is really rude. Second, I'm doing the math and um, you're not wrong, I was sir. like, yeah, because seven years rolled around and I was like, <laughs> I'm tired. See, here. I've tried. And I'm tired of this. And you seem tired. Because it was it was like basic projector gym. Now I look back at it and I'm like, oh, it was that beef, right? Like I was not waiting for invitations. Mm, yeah. Not living with yep. me. You live with me. I'm not waiting for no invitation. What mm -hmm. are you doing? Why are you doing that? No, you mm. need to. But you know, you should just do this. You ain't said that to this person. You need to just tell them that they playing with you for real. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you have to like, and we have strong opinions as projectors because we see we see things like my partner's a manifesting generator and sometimes i'm like do you want my advice like do you want my advice but i ask it not in a way of like do you is there's no option like you have to want my advice I'm like oh, so do you sure. want to know what i think because <laughs> i'm yes, gonna tell you <laughs> it's really a courtesy it's right, truly exactly. a courtesy <laughs> now with my friends and it's funny because i know that i ask and they always say yes, but I don't know what would happen if they were to say no. Because you're right, it's certainly a courtesy. Because if you say something wild to me, I'm going to go, so did you just want me to listen or would you like to know what I think? <laughs> like, did you just need to vent? Because if you, right. you just need to vent, we're good here. I heard you. Right. Right. But do you want to know what I think? And then they go, of course. And I go, this is a mess. So <laughs> <laughs> Let me just start with. Yep. And then it's like oh, all the words. So much. So For many sure, things. Self-projected projector. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now what I think. And you better know. You better hear it right now. Because after I say this. It's gone. You're, it's done. Yep. It's out. Right now, I know the issue. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, that is a hard, like, that's a hard lesson to learn because when you're a projector and you're just like spewing at people, right? Like you, what you think is right and what may, may, or may very well be right. It's like you're like hitting your head against the wall and like you're the only one getting bloody. It's like not helping anybody. It sucks for everyone. Nobody likes it. Well, yeah, like, again, human design was crazy because like the projector thing is success, but the mm -hmm. resentment is bitterness, it's like mm. our not self theme is bitterness. I'm so, so good at bitterness. That's I'm, my, I'm so good with that one. Take my coffee black. <laughs> That's me. Okay. <laughs> one thing about me. <laughs> oh, I'd be bitter. You come in a party, you say hello to everyone first. You say hi to me last. I'm like, bitch, I'm here. <laughs> no, you said hi, but it took you 0.5 seconds. <laughs> Did you see these shoes? Am I not enough for you? <laughs> Did you? You haven't complimented me yet. You haven't told me how pretty and smart I am. <laughs> and also how much you love my mind because that's what's most important. <laughs> I need to hear all of those things. Mm -hmm. I need to hear all of those things. I'm so good at bitterness. I'm so yeah. good at bitterness. And so like, I feel like my childhood and in a lot of ways, I was super recognized. In a lot of ways, I wasn't. But I wasn't being mm. recognized for the things that mattered to me. I was being recognized for things that felt secondary. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it was like, Sitar is very smart. And like, I'm obviously a smart person by like, mm -hmm. it took me, and I say that confidently now, because it feels like such an arbitrary thing to me. Mm. Like, Western intellect is not the most important thing in the world. I'm very yeah. good at it. I had a high SAT score. I was a standardized test bitch, you know, like, so it was, it was. <laughs> Cause then things are so simple. If you can focus for real, it's not hard. It's tedious. It's, it doesn't test your intelligence or your wisdom. Mm -mm. It tests mm -mm. how well you can take a test. Also the SAT, my un unpopular opinion is oh. that's a fucking monopoly it and sure it should is. be canceled. It doesn't make any sense. It makes I, no I don't sense. understand. And I was supposed to be star student bitterness ready okay ready I was, yes give me the bitterness yeah i'm here for bitterness. this okay because people have been playing in my face 
my whole life. This is a projector. <laughs> I did not study for the SAT because I was like, this is bullshit. Because why would I study? I went to a mm-hmm. party. But on projector realness, I knew that I was going to be fine. I did mm-hmm. not take any PSAT prep except for the one that they forced us to take. Right. To, so I took the forced one. I did really well. And I said, and I'm you're good. like, I'm good. <laughs> right. So there were all these kids, especially the kids who could afford. So the other reason why I was like, this is all systematic inequity. Because exactly. all yep, y'all can, can afford to stay for extra PSAT prep. I'm going to get on the bus and go back to the SWATs, baby. I'm going back to Southwest Atlanta. I bus here. I'm not staying with y'all after school. My mama can't pick me up. She got to work. Mm-hmm. Besides band, I'm not staying here, right? So I'm like, forget this, whatever. I take the SAT and I get a really high score. And they call me in the office and they call me in the office with this other white boy. We will leave him unnamed because maybe he's gotten his spiritual shit together and he wants to listen to the podcast. <laughs> so we're going to leave him unnamed, but it's you know very who generous you are, of you. <laughs> but you know who you are and you let your mama rob me. And this is, <gasps> yes. Oh, yes. This is on he ruined the day that that happened. Whew. He let his mama rob me for star student. And because his mama came in there and was like, we had matching SAT scores. And then I want to say, like, I scored higher and like they were trying to decide who was like the best one or whatever. Yeah. And I scored better across the board. Uh-huh. So they were like, well, so but he probably scored- like rocked math or something. He rocked, he, was a math. Nerd. he rocked math. And so they were like, OK, well, we fe-. his mother was like, I just feel that he deserves this because he's been to every single SAT prep. And he just this, this no and this. That's and not the so- point. Yeah, and the so test I was just is like, the test. You know yeah. <laughs> and so on pettiness, I was like, but he lost. <laughs> I didn't even yeah, want to be a star student. And so that's <laughs> and that's why she was mad too. Because he was like, you didn't care. she went to a party. She didn't even study. And I was like, sucks to be dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What like, is that even? Like it's again, the SAT is not a test that like tests how I don't know all, hardworking you are. That's all, not the point. <laughs> at all. And so I was like, okay, well, whatever, you can have it. But I was bitter though. I let him have it, but I sat there and evil eyed him down. Poor man, his stomach probably hurt because I sat there at graduation. It was like looking at him with dagger eyes like that's so fucked up that that happened to you oh stuff like that happens all the time i routinely you know the mug i was drinking out of earlier was like pay black women and don't use them as diversity clout Mm. you know and that's been like that's what i mean where i'm like on bitterness and this is on landmark some of the stuff that i've dealt with in human design like some of it is interpersonal Mm -hmm. but some of it is just bullshit and if anything, I get up here and I'd be like, y'all not finna gaslight me with your crystals. <laughs> You're not finna <laughs> gaslight me with your crystals. <laughs> that rose quartz is for you. Mm. You go meditate on that. There's so much in the wellness world and space, especially I think in like these complex systems like mm-hmm. human design that it upholds structural inequity, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, it's, purposefully difficult to get into unless you like pay for the courses or you pay for the training Mm -hmm. or you like whatever and I think it's so like contrast that to hoodoo practice or to conjure to Mm -hmm. close practices that are passed down through relationships Mm -hmm. right like through community as opposed to something I don't know some other weird hoops that you have to jump through just like yeah it's it feels weird because I'm like there's not enough money in the world for this work that's the thing. It's like money, when I deal with money with clients, and I'm still learning this lesson, like I need to be paid because I have to yeah, do you the do. things that I do. But part of the reason that it's, it really is a spiritual conversation for me because my standing on it is there's not enough money in the world. I want to have enough money so that I can do the work pro bono for the people who I want to do it for. Because mm-hmm. realistically, if it's something real, real heavy, the money is covering recovery time and materials and labor. Like Mm -hmm. some of the stuff that you see on people, I couldn't put a dollar amount on what it's worth to either remove this from you or help you through this. It feels weird. Well, what you do is it really is invaluable. And that is the weird thing for so many healers, practitioners. The work that you do is invaluable. Like you cannot Mm -hmm. put a price on it because you're literally 
in many cases, saving someone's life or completely Child, changing don't the trajectory get me started. of their life. Yeah. We just going to say, I didn't save so many of these people life in LA. And like I said, if you listen to this podcast, you know, <laughs> you who, know who you, you are. are. <laughs> yes. You know who you are. <laughs> you know who you are. And that's fine because you needed it, but you owe me money. You played in my face and that's fine. Mm, <laughs> wow. But yeah, it, no, that... it won't happen again, but it happened. My first year in LA, I got a lot of buzz and not a lot of money. And that taught me a lot about money. And also, again, how folks value spirituality, if at all. Yeah, it's amazing what people will justify a purchase for, right? Like what they value, what they're happy to pay $300 for versus when it comes to like their soul <laughs> or yeah. like their, you know, like that, that that's a very high price tag. I understand it money is complicated. Like so many of us have money trauma and money is so much more than energy. Like to me, yeah. I think that people who say that money is just energy are like gaslighting the world because it's not that like it cannot be just that, but you made a really good distinction in the class that you taught in the North mm -hmm. node about abundance versus currency or money. And mm -hmm. it was so brilliant. Do you remember what you, what you said? Mm -hmm. Probably not exactly, but I under remember the concept, which I was probably yes. talking about abundance and money being two separate things that are related. They're like a Venn diagram, like yeah. the, that little slot in the money in the middle of a Venn diagram where you have like currency and abundance is ideally where you want to live. Right. But you may have a lot of abundant energy. And we all know people like this. And we all probably have been this person in our lives when we look at like the grace of whatever spirits we walk with, where it's like, I was talking to one of my homies who I went to college with because this Mercury retrograde rocked a lot of my artist friends in our pockets. Like mm. currency, a lot of my creative friends who I talked to who are also very spiritual, this last retrograde was bringing up a lot of lessons around money for us. Do you know why? Like, was it the placement or something? I know for me, and I think this is on like soul family, spiritual family, uh, like the placements that were happening for me were dealing a lot with finances because of the way my chart is set up. Mm -hmm. So like, I want to say, and I look at sidereal, but in tropical, my it's Pisces. That's in my third, in my second house mm -hmm. and sidereal is Capricorn. And mm -hmm. so there was a lot of like, when there was that Libra moon, my moon's in Libra. Right. And so there was a lot that was happening in terms of my work actually. So remember when I was saying these people were playing in my face, Mm -hmm. there were some basically I did a lot of work for a lot of very high profile folks in LA who it was the work that saved their life and then when that work was done they went and they patroned men and no. folks mm -hmm, men and folks who they felt were going to give them more of the show because there's a way to perform you know, like, oh, oh, you know, yes. they, they want the about spiritual show. work. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They wanted the uh -huh. show. And so I'm not impressed by celebrity. I think we're probably um, thinking of the same person. Oh, we might be, <laughs> you know, so they wanted a show. And when these clients came to me, because it was more than one person, but when these people came to me in both situations, I was like, look, I don't want your money. That's not why I'm here. However, what you need is expensive. There's no mm -hmm. way you're going to get what you need done. It's expensive and it's time consuming. Yeah. And so they agreed to part of the work. We did part of the work. And then in both of those cases, they decided to go in an alternative direction without really informing me. And so that it was, it was messy. Mm -hmm. And so I have since put things in place where that could no longer happen. I can no longer just walk around giving everybody the homie rate. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? I can't just walk around being like, I got you, fam. That's, that's a cool. hard lesson to learn though, man. I had like, to learn that lesson. That sucks. I had to learn I'm it. Sorry. No, go ahead. And so we were t talking about, I think that experience most recently in this last Mercury retrograde and like how things had changed in the way that I run my business post getting all this attention. When people decided Black Lives Mattered, they also decided mm -hmm. Black Spirituality Mattered for like five seconds. And then everyone <laughs> followed me and I was like, great. You know, like, hi, what's up? <laughs> I don't know if they still feel that way, but time will tell. I think, yes. Didn't you just totally become, get booked out? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, we're not worried about that part. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> we're talking I, about Black Lives Matter. Yeah, but I'm like, yeah, because like, I'm gonna be real. And this is on like self-confidence. Mm -hmm. I was, but like, I've always been too busy. 
Now I'm publicly busy and that's weird. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's weird uh-huh. to be publicly too busy because I was always too busy, but like moving things around. Mm-hmm. Now it's much more touch and go with the work. I used to work with people real, real close, real intimately. And so it kept mm-hmm. me busy. Now it's like more touch and go. And the space for that is more like personal coaching space. Where I, Cause I, I love that space, big projector, much prefer mm-hmm. to be like, how are yep. you? each big day pro- that's big projector energy right there yeah like super focused and attention and energy on one person mm-hmm. I like that and so mm-hmm. even I think on stage I like that but that's you know I'm the person who will stare at their mother in the audience and be like <laughs> take, my, <laughs> take me forward. like I've gotten over it until but- you see that one one tear yeah, and then your mom's I'm face. like okay <laughs> The person I needed to validate me validated me. Now you guys can get this show. That's what it is. Yes. I needed some good generator validation. Now it's good. Okay. Hi, everyone else. That's me for real. But we were talking about that and we were reminiscing back to the abundance thing about how we would be in college and we would look and like my account would be overdrawn. (laughs) <laughs> but I would wake up, my account would be like overdrawn and Bank of America would have hit me with that $35, which like do not it's penalize so, broke people Why the for fuck being do broke. they do that? Yeah, it's like charging interest for payment plans or something. It's like, Yikes. why would you do that? Yeah, so they would overdraft me, then I would look, but then I would have like $20 in my bank, like on my, like in cash. Mm-hmm. And I would be like, let's go drink. Like, <laughs> like, like I can buy up. five shots with this. Yeah, like, like that was college. <laughs> and that was a very abundant time in my life. I didn't have a lot of currency mm-hmm. or it felt like currency was like an amorphous thing for real. Like it was, you know, and I tend to do really well with abundance energy. If anything, disciplining my mind around like dollars and cents has been an exercise. Because mm-hmm. generally I'm like, if I need it, I get it. And it took me a long time to discipline myself to be like, okay. And if I want it, I really get it. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't believe in no, I believe in not right now, or maybe I changed my mind. Yep. I think that comes from being an artist too, because you get a shit ton. I used to be a professional modern dancer. You get a, mm-hmm. you get no's constantly. People being like, no, I don't like you. <laughs> like you, you get actually rejected for like who you are and your skill and your talent. <laughs> and you got to just be like, well, I'll come back to this audition next, same time next week. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So see you again. Like, have you changed your mind yet? What do you right. mean? I'm the same. You're the same. But have you changed your mind? Mm-hmm. And so like with abundance, it is that energy of like, if I need something, that thing is there. So even if I don't necessarily mm-hmm. have money, the food is there or, right. you know, I, I have friends that are going to come check up on me. Money is tangible. It's currency. You want the money in your account. You want it in your hand. You even can play, pray for like tangible assets, like land, like those type of things. But money is mm-hmm. a very material energy where abundance mm-hmm. really isn't. Abundance, if anything, is that energy that people are talking about when they say, and money is an energy. Abundance is. Yes. Yes, that's but right. That's, money's that's tangible. the distinction. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also like, I don't know, abundance like reminds me of just like Jupiter in astrology mm-hmm. right which is like bigger and bigger and bigger it's not always good like so, you don't always yes. want more abundance you know you know what and that's so funny that you say that to me because this is how this is big projector and big spiritualist <laughs> like that has been my lesson Ooh. so when I moved to LA at the end of this like you know very stereotypical like healer's journey like mm-hmm. a bitch was almost dead and she's not <laughs> it was right smack at the the beginning of my Jupiter return I just it was got, right at I the felt beginning. like I was gonna throw up when you said that so continue yeah like mm-hmm. tell me more my about Jupiter that. return it began then and so we all know Jupiter and like again I'm a huge lately my quarantine nerding out has been like Vedic astrology sidereal astrology mm-hmm. like looking at my chart through that lens which has been really interesting so in Vedic systems I'm a Sagittarius rising so Jupiter mm-hmm. is my ascendant ruler it's the energy through which I move it's your dude Um, yeah yeah it's my vibe and so I generally Jupiter being like spiritual and guru but also being like this happy jolly like always Mm -hmm. has enough like 
for me, Jupiterian energy is like the auntie at the cookout with all the rings. <laughs> who always, you know what I mean? Who like always yeah. got a man and always got the food and always got uh-huh. the bud light. And she uh-huh. always slides some money to you under the and table. And she doesn't have any kids, but she's awesome. That's, she's like your favorite. Yeah, she's your she, rich auntie. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. Rich like, she's me she's fucking fun. Energy. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I've always kind of moved like that because abundance or luck, like Jupiter is that planet. So Mm -hmm. I think in my own personal life, I have seen that if I say that I want something to expand, it will. And I Mm -hmm. had to learn very quickly that I need to be a good steward of my blessings. Like when I asked, I've asked for expansion, received that expansion. And now the phase that I'm in in my life really is about taking stock of the things that I have and putting them in order. And if Mm -hmm. anything, now I'm open to the expansion, but I'm much more choosy. Because Mm -hmm. I used to say yes to everybody or everything. And I used to, you know, put a lot of energy into abundance and making sure that I had that. And it's an interesting place to be because we don't talk about like Jupiter. It's a benefic planet. So we think about expansion. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the influence of like Saturn or these things that provide structure. Discipline and structure. Exactly. You know, then you're out here and, you know. I can, I've had plenty of reading in different traditions where they're like, you have these like very rock and roll placements, like do not over drink, do not like they go moderation, balance, mm-hmm. moderation and balance. You're here to learn moderation and balance. You can make a lot of money. Don't spend it all. Also, don't be too austere. They like, don't no extremes. Hey, it's that. And it's the, it's the middle. There's, mm-hmm. it's not either or thinking it's like, you got to live in the middle somehow. And mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's discernment, right? Like that's what that that lesson is. And I think even in like spirituality, discernment's really important. And like that is to me like the the badge of someone who is truly like tapped in when they're not Mm -hmm. always looking for guidance outside of themselves, when they can discern within themselves. That's like, Mm -hmm. that's lit. Like that's what I aspire to. Me too. When I started working and I was really like, coming into my own as a spiritualist, that was one of my biggest lessons that kept being reiterated to me is like, trust yourself. Mm. And we talked about like how I came to this and how like I had to learn to make decisions for myself, but then trusting what I hear as a reader, trusting what I hear as a practitioner, trusting, especially when other people are in your space, trusting my discernment when it comes to the clients I want to take. And I don't want to take trust the gigs I want to take. And the gigs that I don't want to take, because especially as a musician, mm-hmm. big projector, the music industry is run by generators. All in- industries Uh-oh. are run by generators. Yeah. Business is run by generators too. like finance, all of it. Like people that can work a million hours a day. Mm-hmm. And who it is in their best interest to say yes to everything. Mm-hmm. It's in mm-hmm. their best interest to like, as long as it sounds good to them and they feel excited to just. And so yeah. I've said no to a lot of things that I got a lot of flack for Mm -hmm. but I had to use my discernment and so that's really that's it wow that you just totally connected something in my brain like Mm -hmm. that is we don't live in a world that values discernment we Mm -mm. to your point it's like take as much as you possibly can and like cross your fingers and hope for the best and just say yes to everything that comes your way and we're not taught how to be discerning like we're taught to just be grateful for any crumbs that are thrown our way Mm -hmm. and that is not it like that's Mm -mm. not that's not right. <laughs> I mean, well, it's I capitalism. So. It's unhealthy. Yep. And when you don't have discernment, then you eat anything and you go anywhere and you let people talk to you any kind of way and you work any job, even if it doesn't make sense. And you take any little piece of pay. You don't mm-hmm. even think about, I remember. And like I said, I was set up for this because my mom is a hairstylist. Mm-hmm. So I watch my mother make money every day. Right. And even now that's reflected that I had to correct somebody on the Twitter because someone says, Tar, I want you to do a drop on payday. And I tweeted and said, I don't know when payday is. Mm-hmm. So when do you get paid? And I asked everybody, when do y'all get paid? Is it Friday? Is it every other Friday? Mm-hmm. And you know how Twitter is. Somebody came and said, ooh, I wish that I was abundant enough to not know when payday is. Oh, my God. Really? And I said, so I, I am abundant. <laughs> so thanks for that. But that's not why I don't know when payday is. I know because my mother worked in an industry where if you don't work, you don't eat. Mm -hmm. every day right like I come from people where every single day is a day to go get the money and Mm -hmm. so I remember my mom didn't work for seven dollars an hour or nine dollars an hour it wasn't an hourly my daddy used to be like make sure you separate your 
time for your money, which was great advice for a projector child. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. the you know what I mean? Make sure that yeah. your money is not just based in how much you can labor. Yep. Right? And so I watch people with no discernment. And I think that my life set me up in a way where when I got sick, I couldn't work. Like what mm-hmm. happened in COVID happened mm-hmm. to me two years ago where life-threatening right. illness made me stay my ass in the house. And I had mm-hmm. to figure out what else I was going to do with my life besides just music, besides whatever else I was doing outside. Right. Besides grinding 14 hours a day for the rest of your life until you keel over and die. Until you keel over and die. And we don't do discernment and we don't do denial. We don't do moderation. We don't do any of those things. And I feel that they're so important. They're so important. And it sounds like all of those lessons have come, a lot of those lessons have come through just like objectively shitty things that have happened, like getting really sick, but also through spiritual practice, because what we've been talking about this whole time is living in the, in the liminal, in the, and Mm -hmm. not in the either, or it's having discernment and like seeing both things at the same time and deciding like, It's actually not relying on like, oh, this is good or this is bad because society tells me this person is good or this person is bad. It's having our own discernment about what we feel about them Mm -hmm. and like how we choose to take in information or engage in the world. It's deep. It's deep because it's like, again, I feel like my work is inherently liberatory work. So, so much of the discussion with me is always going to come back to liberation and liberatory spaces. Mm -hmm. But like, I always tell people like morality is such an objective thing. Okay. Like slavery was legal. It's people who really feel like that was cool. And at Mm -hmm. the time that was what's up. And there's so many things that I can see with my spiritual discernment now that don't Mm -hmm. sit well in my spirit, but are okay with people right now. And so I can't rely on the discernment of other people or even what society says. And like I said, from someone sitting outside of that space who sees clearly, like yeah. knowing dead people is a gift because they don't lie. <laughs> yeah, dead people ain't got no reason. They do they have do their lie. own opinions, though. They lie they, yeah, and they have they, their own <laughs> opinions. Yeah. But when you ask about <laughs> objective stuff, they will tell you sometimes things that living people are afraid to tell you. Because they ain't got nothing to lose. They don't have anything to lose. Oh my God. They don't have anything to lose. And so they will lie over small stuff like how to get more offerings or family. (laughs) You know, if they have family (laughs) secrets and there's something to invest, like they lie. Yeah. Yeah. But the one thing that my folks have always been very clear about is like my positioning in the world and like what it is that is happening outside. They're very Mm -hmm. straight shooters. If I'm reading for a client, my spirits might be like, that's a mess. That man ain't no good. He going to steal from her. They talk like that. It's not like, well, maybe there's a threatening situation around. Yeah. There's no like veiled language. They they don't sound yeah. like mystics. I mean, yeah. at least, you know, it's like they no. speak like straightforward. Yeah. Direct. They, they speak directly. And I feel that like people use this morality left and right and like this good and bad thing. And then Mm -hmm. when I speak to their ancestors, their spirits are not even requiring that of them. Mm -hmm. Your spirits are not even holding you to this like objective standard of good and bad. And as a matter of fact, it's probably harming you. You know what I mean? It's probably causing you harm depending on where you're placed and where you're situated or you're harming others because you think that you good. Right. Being so rigid and being Mm -hmm. myopic and the way that you're seeing what's right and what's wrong. Like Mm -hmm. it kind of makes you a little paranoid because you have to constantly be be discerning. You can't Mm -hmm. just like rest on, I know what's right. You have to really look with clear eyes at everything you do and question like, is this on point? Or like, do I need to to write this shift? Do I need to fix this? And I think like, Mm -hmm. I don't know, that's where intuition probably comes in too. And our bodies tell us like, this is right or no yeah your body is a big one I think the trusting the body and what you feel inherently is such a crucial piece and I'm still trying to do that I'm still removing there's capitalist trauma around listening to the body so many of us do we will work because of our will at the expense of our bodies Mm -hmm. and then you're like why am I feeling crazy and it's like girl your body's been telling you for two weeks that you couldn't do what you've been doing and oftentimes it's behind money. And I would say 99% of mm-hmm. the time. I mean, like capitalism, originally the primitive accumulation, were, which kicked off capitalism, was we were like, you know, 
women were producing. Yes. <laughs> labor was actual physical labor, women giving birth to workers, right? Oh. And to the working class. And so, especially for women, it's ignoring our bodies and what our bodies need and rest is inextricably linked to capitalism. Well, for sure. And like, I cannot deny the fact that when I fell under spiritual attack in the in the issue for me as a black woman in society, when it was like a collapse of what my body could no longer withstand, it was in my reproductive system. And if you know the mm. history of capitalism and you know what it means to be an African-American person or a black person mm. of the diaspora, yes. especially a woman, reproductive issues are ancestral trauma. Mm. You look and you go, okay, I have so much trauma around being currency and being forced to produce being forced to produce whether that's children whether that's labor sometimes both at the same time yeah. right yeah. yeah this is why for me discipline will always look like rest and resistance always looks like rest it's why I like so love the Nat ministry. It's why mm -hmm. I so love seeing black women especially assert their space to do nothing. Because productivity, you know, I read this post and may have been the Nat Ministry when they were like, you know, the number one thing that slaves were whipped for was oversleeping. That was the number one thing that you oh could be God. beat for is oversleeping. And I think about how light a sleeper. I come from folks who we wake up like, and I remember yeah. watching people in my family like forever be sleep deprived. And then they would sleep for like two days straight. I used to work like that. I used to come home from college and I wouldn't get sick in college. Like finals, everyone was sniffly. I would never get sniffly. you get sick as soon as you got home. And sleep for like four days, unhealthily yeah. sleep, like KO. Yeah. And I'm like, I could never be like, what kind of like pendulum swinging life? Like, no, no. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and so, yeah, capitalism is a hard one. And especially for all of us, really, especially for those of us who are women, especially if we're Black women in the U.S., especially in the Caribbean, especially if you're living in the space where ancestrally you are the currency, it's a very mm -hmm. strange positioning. It's mm -hmm. a very strange place to be. And so dealing with ancestral trauma around money is a huge part of my work, especially with my Black female clients. Mm -hmm. And I've had to be really innovative in the way I feel that you can approach it because it's not the same rhetoric around money that you would find elsewhere it can't be right it's not one size fits all and that's why the idea of money is just energy is really i think harmful for a, a lot of people especially mm -hmm. people who experience marginalization especially black women like it's not that there's so much more there's epigenetic trauma there's literal dna trauma that mm -hmm. people are carrying so i think for me now spiritually what i've come to in the conversation that i have is like in removing feelings of unworthiness and working in a spiritual framework, because money is not just energy, but it, everything is energy. Yes. So then you just go objectively and go, well, what is the energy of this thing? Like we were talking about spirit being in a space. What is the spirit? Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm kind of like the way I work now is like, if I walk up in this thing and money is owed to me, run it. And money is inherently owed to me. Any space I walk into as a black woman. I'm going to be mm -hmm. real. I walk into Bank of America. They was throwing niggas over the ships. Y'all owe me money. You see what mm -hmm. I'm saying? Like, yes. that's on that. And so now I'm very confident in the way that I deal with money because I know that it's mine. And having mm -hmm. talked to my dead people, I know that it's not only mine, but there's so much money that's supposed to be coming through my hands and other Black people's hands. Mm -hmm. Like, I have no guilt about that. It's essential mm -hmm. that, and, and, you know, I have many conversations in the political space around reparations. I wrote a song called Reparations, mm -hmm. but I think that equity and spiritual reparations are just as crucial as financial reparations. And right. I feel that financial reparations are just as crucial as spiritual reparations. And I just feel that that is the only, for me, positioning myself that way was the healing space because it's one thing to go oh, what was me? This happened to me, blah, blah, blah. And that's true. But then you go, shame on you. Now, you know, I had someone talk to me and they go, someone said to me, and it was very ignorant. They were like, how do you feel not knowing where your ancestors are from? I said, I know where my ancestors are from. And what makes you think that your Western borders matter to me? Does it matter to mm -hmm. me 
that my ancestors are from the colonized space called Gabon, it doesn't matter to me that I know them. First mm -hmm. of all, second of all, as a diasporic black person, I feel like I'm from everywhere. Second of all, that's not for me to feel. That's for you to feel. How do you feel knowing that you did this? How do you feel knowing that your ancestors was running up doing craziness? Yeah. You know? And so I think there's so much of the conversation around money because, of, and this is why morality, we work in a morality that shames people for not having. Even mm -hmm. though systemically we steal from those people. And you see that with the continent of Africa. You see that with the descendants of the continent of Africa. You see that with African people globally. And you see that in other contexts. You see it with women. You see it with, there's no reason for there to be homeless people in the U.S. There's no reason. We have mm -hmm. more than enough space and more than enough resources and more than enough land. And besides bureaucracy, there is no reason. And when people go, oh, blah, 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 it's never going to be peaceful. That's the one thing. It's not peaceful now. So your version of peaceful is just based on your, but people feel very threatened because it's morality. So me having things makes me a good per person. So now if I give other people things, then how do I discern myself as better than them? Right. We conflate abundance with goodness. Mm -hmm. Like if you, because so many people have the heaven's reward fallacy sort of like, mm -hmm. If I am good, I will be rewarded. And that's not true. It's like not. That's, that's, that's a cognitive distortion. That's not true. You can it's do good things. True. Like, good on you. That's great. But that doesn't mean that you deserve good things to happen to you. Yeah, you don't and deserve like anything. And, mm -mm, and good and bad things happen to people all the time. Yes. And bad things will happen to you no matter how good you are. And so in an African spiritual sense, when I work with my clients, it's, all, it's like, I need your boat not to be rock so heavy. That's what it is. My mm -hmm. goal is not for you to never lose money. You will. You know, right. I think about like, okay, you can have a bajillion million dollars and make a poor investment and lose half a bajillion jillion, and that's going <laughs> to suck. Right. You won't be but like, you still got a shit ton of money. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I need. I don't need it to be that nothing bad ever happens. And so you can end up like gaslighting your own self. I know for me, as in my spiritual journey for a long time, I was like, I'm so, I was resentful. Like even mm. after getting sick, that bitterness. The, first, the bitterness, the first thing, <laughs> remember where I said the thing that I'm still working on about that is that I feel it didn't need, need to be so dramatic. Right. And I'm coming to terms with it. But I'm going to be real, even though it's been echoed to me by diviners, like I'm sitting on the mat, like, why would y'all do this to me? Mm -hmm. And my spirits are sitting on the other side, like, bitch, we saved you. Right. You know what I'm like, you were going to die. Thank you. Yeah. They're, I'm like, why would y'all? And they're like, we saved your life. And I'm all, but I don't understand. Because in my mind, I was like, I'm a good person. Yes. Right. I, do I didn't good. deserve this. Like, I didn't why deserve me? this. Why me? You know, like, why would this happen to me? Mm -hmm. And I will say it's on Black womanhood that, like, even before I processed through the trauma, I was like, well, we got to freak this shit. Like, <laughs> and, it was <laughs> and it was Black women who were like, but what you going to do? Now I look back and I'm like, I was working. I was working on the psychic hotline. I got fired. I was working on the psychic hotline the week no. I got from the hospital, yes. No. <laughs> yes. You're like, I listen, but kind of. <laughs> I was like, well, I I'm hear you guys, but they, I'm going to do it this way. <laughs> you said be a spiritual person. So I was like, well, hell, what's the fastest <laughs> way to do it? Because I was tired. I, was, I wasn't worried about being psychic. I knew I could do that because I know everybody's right. business. But I was like, right. how do you make money in the bed doing this? So I was on the psychic hotline. But now I look back, I'm like, I shouldn't have been on nobody's psychic hotline. No. I shouldn't have been working at Sephora. Mm. How much I did that I, and it was cool. I liked all that free stuff. But there was so much I was doing that I shouldn't have been doing on lack of discernment mm. and on money. Mm. On like hearing a clear spiritual calling and being like, but the way my bank account is set up, <laughs> y'all gonna need to run that right now. <laughs> right like uh let's 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 pick up the pace a little bit we need to see some more commas in here yeah i literally said that i literally <laughs> went to my altar one time and was like i never want to see an account without a comma again we are only doing commas minimum two a, commas <laughs> i wrote a petition that was like commas 2020 like and now you got commas and we are gonna stay commaed out i want a tattoo to say commas 
Mm-hmm. Period. <laughs> Comments forever. I'm yep. like, what do y- <laughs> y'all? I was sitting in the altar room, like, what do y'all need to make this real for you? <laughs> what do you need from me? Do you want liquor? Do you- We're not doing lack of commas in the bank account. Mm-mm. No, that's a and struggle. No, and it's really easy once you get the one comma. Getting the second comma is moving it over, mm-hmm. going from five figures to six figures. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. easy. That's once you can do it, once you got the five, oh, you can mm-hmm. go into the six mm-hmm. really easily. If you certainly, if you have the right like support and community and guidance, mm-hmm. it's easy. For me, if anything, the conversation I was having with other black entrepreneurs is like, do we have the infrastructure for the money? Let's, do we have the infrastructure? Because bringing traffic is not just enough. Like run the business grants, please run the infrastructure money. Because so many of us are just kind of scrambling looking and even myself in my business, I feel good about it, but I really had to have a sit down. My orders are delayed. For example, mm. I'm somebody that it used to be shipping. Yeah. Boom, boom. Right. I wanted to have everything shipped out by the top of this month. And I sent the email this month that said, everybody's getting their stuff by Christmas. Mm-hmm. And I mean that because it's yeah. more than a thousand of y'all. And it's just me and my assistant making stuff with yeah. hands, I'm, you know, and it yeah. has to sit on the altar. And so for me, it's like, oh, I used to do pre-orders. Part of the reason I'm behind is because I used to pre-order products. Yeah. Now, when I drop a pre-order, they all buy it. It's no, you know, so I'm like, oh. <laughs> right. You're like and fuck. Gratitude. <laughs> I'm not expecting that. <laughs> right. <laughs> gratitude, for sure. But like now having to change my business model is, is something that it's been an interesting challenge. I like it because I'm nerdy like that. I enjoy stuff like that. Yeah. But it has been interesting. And then also on capitalism, like I'm not a tell far bag. Like I'm a person mm-hmm. and sometimes people yep. shop for spiritual products. So they shop for like, I've had many a person in my, it's nice, the tra- public traffic, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but like a lot of my clients are new divination clients and they are like what I call outside people. Like they strangers. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they just sometimes I sit in the divination I'm like what did you need and they're like I just wanted to see what this is and I'm like well I'm not a circus act girl yeah I call those people wellness sluts because they just yeah. will do anything not to slut shame just like they're trying everything and they don't know what they want and like it's a little sloppy sometimes it's sloppy because then they come over here and they get their feelings hurt by these dead people because it always <laughs> be those people who need some real they they're have lost. Some real, they're they lost. don't know what they want Yeah, they always have real stuff going on and so when I see those people, I'm kind of happy they arrived. But then I'm also like, I might not be what you think this is about to be. <laughs> right. I don't think you're, you know what this is you don't know that what we're this getting is. you into. <laughs> hoping it's going to land, crossing my fingers that it's going to be the breakthrough for you. I'm ready. I'm, I'm hoping that this is it. If anyone could break through, it's you. Let's be honest. Thank you. I just am like, y'all want, and I love a singing bowl. I'm going to give me some singing bowls and be in there. <laughs> I watch me. I'm going to be this in This is the unpopular like, opinion. Yes. Tell me. Tell me. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is the unpopular opinion. The unpopular opinion is that your spiritual healer doesn't need to be politically correct to be good at their job. Oh. Whoa. That's it. And whoa. You need to pick okay. someone that is healing to you. And if compassion is a part of your ethic, I suggest you do that. But. but a spiritual is not a character trait. Like we were talking about, like that heavens, it's spiritual is not a character trait. Wow, you're right. And so it's not a flavor. It's not a flavor for real. It's not a, and it's been interesting because even I made that mistake when I wanted to do this work. This is about to show my Libra moon. I'm about to show my Libra moon behind. <laughs> they me, were like, Satara, why are you so resistant to doing spiritual work? And like one single tear rolled down my face. And I was like, I don't want to wear a long skirt. <laughs> and they were like, what? <laughs> and I was like, I still want to wear my Jordans. I want to wear my overalls. And they were like, who said you couldn't? Who said you couldn't wear that? But in my mind, like people were only going to want me if I was like on witch talk with crystal jewelry in a head wrap playing Erykah Badu. Like (laughs) doing comedic yoga with some crystals all around me. Just like all white tunics, no bras, and like no, just titties out, (laughs) hairy armpits, and no shaming because live. No No shaming. We like fashion. We love the beauty. Like 
I we love want a good that. cat eye. Like, I like it, you know? I like it, and I want to serve that. And I feel that on the flip side, so many people get themselves in really messy spiritual situations because they're looking for an aesthetic from their practitioner oh, yes. um, or a certain languaging. That's why I say politically correct. You're looking for a certain languaging along mm -hmm. with an aesthetic from your practitioner. And then they don't do nothing, but they wrap it up in a nice little bow where they tell you what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. Like I could make so much more money if I was willing to be like, every time somebody sat on my mat, I was like, so the first thing is there's just such a white light around you. <laughs> you are so protected and I need you to open your heart and feel the love <laughs> that your ancestors have for you. There's spirit babies all around you. Yes. They're just floating in your aura. Angels your aura are just so floating. clear. <laughs> yes. I've never met somebody so energetically just alone. Oh, I'm actually very moved by this experience. <laughs> your karma is unlike any karma I've yes. ever seen. It's, am it's amazing. Oh my God. In yeah. that voice, they want you to yeah. be like, so what brings you today? So take a deep breath in with me. <laughs> and that's just not it because halfway through my five o'clock reading I'm gonna have my dinner <laughs> and yeah. I tell them I'd be like so you the five o'clock slot which means I may eat right here so if you want to get your snack get your snack yeah and also like why is that a I don't understand why eating while you're doing things, especially things that take energy is a problem. Like why it's viewed as like unprofessional. I don't understand that. It's Western and capitalist and unprofessional and weird. And it also lets me know that people again are outside of tradition because one mm -hmm. thing about like a real hoodoo practitioner, like old school, somebody's granddaddy, he may just be eating boiled peanuts and spitting them. Like he will burp in your face. It don't matter. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. especially these men, male practitioners as a whole don't care. But you see what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, like, yes, I have a lot to say about that. But yeah, like they don't, they don't that's have to. That's a whole other mess. They don't yeah, have that's to. Another, that's another podcast. That's another podcast <laughs> for another day because a mess. <laughs> but I just like traditionally, you're not, expe you're expecting a different level of etiquette, a different type of etiquette from your diviner. Do they know their lineage? Are they following protocol when they open and close? Like we have our things that are important, but eating is not right. an offense. Now, I wouldn't eat while you were like right, right in the middle of throwing, you know, like maybe throw the diet face and then <laughs> <laughs> take a sandwich break. <laughs> right. But it reminds me of school, like being in trouble for eating in the middle of school or something or like not being respectful. And like, why is being a having like taking care of my basic human needs disrespectful? I don't understand I that. I truly want more. It is the biggest crime that they did to the American schooling system is overlook the history of slavery in this country. And it was intentional. And oh, yeah. I think, of course, because of my intersections, I talk a lot about liberation. We've talked about this, but as folks who live in the Western world, it's crucial that we analyze the systems of slavery and anti-Blackness because mm -hmm. they firmly shape our schooling and educational systems and our policing systems come directly and our governmental systems. When you look at the Electoral mm -hmm. College, like if you are an American in particular, there's no way to get any part of your government. I mean, the entire Civil War, like so we need to know it. Because not allowing people to leave to eat is a direct holdover from enslavement. And it's happening to little white children. And then you mm -hmm. talk to white people and they go, I don't understand why you're so caught up with slavery. And I go, bitch, you should be. Yeah. We should all be very concerned with why our schooling system still feels that lunch is not a thing that people should have. And is modeled after prison, which yeah, is. Well, yes, prison is, is mo it, modeled after slavery, which is modeled after. Right. <laughs> school is it, modeled after prison. And like, yeah, this is what we're paying. First of all, like our, our tax dollars are paying for perpetuating and it doesn't even work. It doesn't work to educate kids like that. does. That's not the point. It's to mm -hmm. it's to keep people inculcated in capitalism and in capitalist structures. And for to sure believe that that's the way for sure. And it's not. And I'm just like, I wish everybody would just look objectively and be like, oh, like this is something that is systemically set up this way to oppress all of us as a collective like yeah. as a collective we are all catching the short end of the stick and it's been interesting for me to look at what happened in COVID because more people are seeing it 
And I remember I talked to my grandmother and my great grandmother about the Great Depression mm-hmm. and was like, how was the Great Depression? She was like, yeah, tell me more about that. Tell me more about that. Yeah. <laughs> Could you unearth your trauma? <laughs> I would love for you to just dig that up. I'm just, just curious. Just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but she said something so crazy, which I mean, it makes perfect sense where she was like, we were always poor. Mm-hmm. Black folks were always poor. Mm-hmm. Like it was just like that. If anything, right. you watch people who had not realized what it was like then have right. to, and that's why it's such a big conversation. And I feel now we're looking at these unemployment numbers and all these things. And this is why I'm like, oh, y'all decided Black Lives Matter. And people are inherently systemically, like people are naturally self-interested. Mm-hmm. But I remember watching people and being like, y'all hungry, huh? It's been three <laughs> weeks since y'all last stimulus check. And then yep. be like, you don't know what to do with government cheese. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do they even give government cheese anymore? I was like, wow. I watched my college friends because I went to like a very expensive school. Mm-hmm. Very, very privileged folks. Right. And now they, they're artists and they're in the creative fields and they are doing their things and there's no touring industry. Mm, yeah. And I'm watching, you can tell very clearly who's like, okay. I'm going to figure this out. Like, I'm going to figure this out. Yeah. And the people who are just like, how could this happen? Like, they're so yeah. far. <laughs> that is so interesting to watch from afar. I feel like we have very similar groups of people yeah. that we went to college with because we both went to college for art. And yeah, mm-hmm. to watch some people, like, honestly get their shit together so quickly in the way mm-hmm. of just, like, finding a new solution, right? Being creative. Mm-hmm. Like, so fast that I it kind of gave me whiplash. But I'm For like, sure. yeah, get on it. Mm-hmm. And other people who are, like, questioning every part of their lives, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe this is the only time that's they've had to, perhaps. But, mm-hmm. yeah, it will be... I mean, if we... The, the Great Depression, to your point, was a great equalizer in many ways. And mm-hmm. we got some really incredible systems that came out of it like Mm -hmm. social security right (laughs) hopefully i mean like we'll get something that comes out of this that's i'm feeling a little more hopeful which i'm feeling a little more hopeful i'm feeling like it's interesting because with the election i saw the initial room when he got up there and was like i won (laughs) you remember that yeah so maybe four and this is why discernment and this is also why like space and like on clairvoyancy maybe I didn't want to divine on the election. It wasn't something that I wanted to look at. But then I remember my curiosity got the worst of me because all of my, (laughs) all of my friends are very, I come from like an activist background. I was an organizer in college and like produced a lot of shows. Mm -hmm. And my family is very in like, you know, public health and social justice and womanism Mm -hmm. and the arts. Like I come from those type of folks, especially black folks who are very into like, like policy change. Yeah. And one of the big things that happened for me when I became a spiritualist is that I moved away from the policy space mm-hmm. and very into the spiritual space. And a lot right. of people looked at me because there were things that I saw where I was like, you know, you have big, what, dark night of the soul, third eye open up. And you like, these niggas is lying. It don't matter. You know, <laughs> you're like, wait, <laughs> they're cheating. <laughs> right. So you like, you realize which you're like, they've been cheating. And if you know, black history, you know, black liberatory history, you know, that they've been cheating this whole time. But it was interesting for me to see because I had a dream and I saw all of the red states that we saw before the mail-in ballots. Uh, and I saw him get up there to make a speech. And I heard him say what he said, which was like, the ele- it's looking good for me. Let's just call it. Uh, and I called one of my really best friends and was like, girl, I still have hope. And I, I'm not but normally it's very wrong. small. But it's I very said, well, small. Because <laughs> when I see stuff, I'm usually not wrong. I've seen a lot right. of stuff that I didn't want to see. And right. when I see it like that, because right. when I ask, I can be swayed by my own. But if it comes in a dream, I've seen terrible, terrible things and been like. And so when I saw that, I was like, oh, hell, here we go. <laughs> and then it happened and all the votes wasn't counted. And I was like, <laughs> 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 I hate being psychic. I was like, why would y'all play with my emotions? Why wouldn't y'all show me the rest? I wonder why they did that. Maybe to just, why? My spirits are messy. My spirits, okay, so, oh yeah, like I come from like maroon folks. My ancestors are not very bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. I come from runaways. Like even in my immediate history, the reason my family is in Ohio is because they ran on foot. I asked my, yeah, I asked like, why do we live 
in Ohio and they were like, it was right above the Ohio river. Mm -hmm. Like I have folks that lived in like the great dismal swamp in North Carolina and Virginia. Like I did not come from, and I argue that no black person, because I've seen a lot of us, the narrative that we have of black people accepting slavery peacefully, Mm -hmm. especially in the U S is not true. You could look at a timeline of slave rebellions and know that it was a very violent period in history. (laughs) Like nobody was about that life, Mm -hmm. but I can look at my own personal group of dead people and be like, they just not with it. So my dad folks are not the people to ask about politics. That's not their thing. They are like, when I talk to them, they'd be like, I mean, machetes. We poison people. And I'm like, that's not dead ass. Like, you guys, that's not, no, no. That's not, they're going to put me under the jail, child. They're going to put me right. underneath not, the jail. No, that's not what I'm looking for. But that's but that's the history. And so, that's you know. What they, and that's what they know. And right? that's, I mean, it was what was necessary. And in yeah. a lot of ways, you know, you look at Malcolm X and you go, They've not stopped killing us. This is one mm-hmm. thing that they've not stopped doing. And so I can't yeah. argue with dead people around what they see. Because like I said, what right. they see is what they see. Yeah. And everybody is over here worried about the looting. And I'm like, this is on capitalism. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not about to go outside and loot things. However, when I see people looting, I'd be like... Can you blame them? Like, yeah. Go to Beverly Center. <laughs> stay at a ball with Crenshaw. <laughs> go up there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like, like, cool, get what you get, get what you need. And so it's that's why I feel that like the entire election cycle, I was informed because all my friends are very informed. I read the New York Times and the LA Times with my coffee. Mm-hmm. And then I go to the BBC because I want to see what's going on. So I'll read, I like to read my news. I don't like Me to too. watch it. That's on not growing up with a Cannot. TV cannot watch it but i do like listening to the daily do you ever listen to the daily yes and i like it so and i like it sometimes me too (laughs) but yeah and so they did it i think just to be messy because it was so they they have opinions like you said exactly they have opinions and so they were like this man a damn fool look at this (laughs) that was it i made my own assumptions But they were, you know, they're like, this is a comedy. (laughs) You thought it was a drama (laughs) or a horror movie. And they're like, no, no, this is hilarious. They think it's not funny as hell. They was like, oh, (laughs) yeah, look, you see this? He finna tweet and fire somebody now. (sighs) He finna fire somebody on Twitter. (laughs) What? I'm like, we still have many days where he's like, you know, oh, he's about to show his whole behind. Everybody just lay low because he's about to show out. He got huh. a few more days. They gonna he they gonna have to pull him from the desk. He gonna be holding <laughs> like no. Oh no. man. Ugh. Well, thank goodness mm-hmm. there was more to that story than just that dream that you had. <laughs> I know, and that's on discernment because so many spiritualists was over here tweet tweeting, saying all type of stuff, and I just was like, let me keep my mouth closed because I feel uh-huh. that something else. I only told my few friends though because I caught up shook and I was like what i just saw it's not it so mm-hmm. fingers crossed we're gonna have something different happen because everybody had been praying and doing a ritual work and everybody wants something different than what we mm-hmm. didn't have mm-hmm. well i won't say everybody because it was a mess it it is a mess it is a it is a mess okay can i have one last unpopular opinion oh fuck yeah dude Give just because i have you me. right here <laughs> yes but this is yes. a question what is going on with white women what's going on I'm not surprised, but I thought that we looked at the last election and we was like, now y'all fucking up. Right. Like, right. I feel that black women as a collective had the time. We really took the time to be like, you fucking up. And then here go Eva Longoria. She can't get no more desperate housewives checks for me. It's over, <laughs> girl. Your show's canceled in my life. Mm, so it's all. And I'm yeah. like, what is wrong? What's wrong? <laughs> like what are you so confused about yeah it's proximity to power and white women have a lot to be embarrassed about and like we I'm have like, a lot of work to do with each other you know yeah tell them please tell them that chad is never going to make you equal <laughs> he's never ever he, going to let you he does not give a shit he doesn't about, care he, about you he does girl. not give a shit yeah <laughs> he couldn't care less and yeah, it is. I grew up in a very Republican place and it is totally 
infuriating to have those conversations. I'm asking, well, I'm asking genuinely because I grew up in a very pro-Black, Black liberatory space. I'm a Black woman yeah. from Atlanta. So yeah. when I say what is wrong with white women, that is literally me like, what is going on? Besides what I know systemically, as yeah. a spiritualist, I'm happy that you said it's proximity to power because I'm like, yeah. y'all are confused. Aside from my own personal opinion about it, yeah, like and how it doesn't make no sense and the politics don't match up. It's yeah. also just confusion because his whole like white men's entire ethos is based on being better than everybody, including you. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I have a lot of opinions on it and but I'll give you my my unpopular yes, opinion. Yes, please. It's lack of empathy. That's what I think. <laughs> it's lack of empathy and sur- like you could call it survival although it it isn't that. Mm-hmm. It's proximity to power. It's like the false perception that mm-hmm. you need to take care of your family and survive and you have to do this. It's individualism at mm-hmm. its core as opposed to being communal and mm-hmm. There are, I don't know, I can't make excuses for it because I don't really get that, but I think it's wrong personally, but that's what I see when I talk mm-hmm. to white women who voted for Trump. Ooh, I'm so sorry that you know them. Dude. Yeah. Like people that I grew up with. And the thing that does give me hope is that after very long conversations where, you know, we're, we got almost into a screaming match and better <laughs> eventually they come around because you can't argue with empathy and compassion. Yeah. You can't. And like, and also logic, like it's not logical to vote for someone who like Donald Trump, who stands for hate. Like it it just isn't, you can't argue with the facts. And so when you sit someone down and you show them, right. But it's really like going back to our conversation, it's either or thinking, right. It's like, there's no space for the in-between for the and. And that's where we live. There's not a binary anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that we would all do better. (laughs) A lot of things would change if we understood that the binary doesn't exist in any form, like Mm -hmm. gender, good or evil, good or bad. It just, that's not true. That's not reality anymore. So Mm -hmm. no, for sure. No, thank you for that. Cause I'm like, I'm looking at it and I'm going to be real, like as somebody who understands the history I wasn't surprised. I was like, if anything, I was like, told y'all. Like, I was mm-hmm. like, it's not, it's not vibes because I've tried right in the right. past, but right. I won't lie. As I, it just made me very, it made me feel very sad because when I look at people that I share space with or that I share creative space with, mm-hmm. you look and then you go, oh, these are the people that you're in community with. Like, these are the people that belong to you, whether it's good or bad. Like, this is your people for real. And you're going to have to really go. I have so many of my friends where, like, their trauma, and this is on white people's trauma, was arguing with their family this whole election season. Mm-hmm. And, like, then they would come to me and be like, Satara, I'm arguing with my family. And I'd be like, oh, your family been racist, me, on Psychic <laughs> Friendship. Like, I'm friends with you. <laughs> but you right. notice I don't come to your house for dinner? That's because I'm not yeah. trying to be in that energy. Yeah. And they'd be like, oh, shit, my family been racist. I'd be like, yeah, they've been racist. They've been like <laughs> yeah, that. This you isn't new. This didn't like happen. This is how it's yeah. always been. And, but it was crazy to see just because I really, I was really like expecting it to be white men. And of course it is. But then when you, I looked at the recent numbers, I was like, y'all going off. Y'all said racism and rhinestones, okay? Mm. y'all said bump it's and mm. american flags mm-hmm. and i just am not here for it i was like i was shocked i wasn't shocked because i know but i was in my heart i was shocked because i want better again compassion right we we want to see the best in people we want to believe that people at their core like see humanity right mm-hmm. and see each other as opposed to like are just looking out for their best interests and i think like we hoped that, at least I hoped, I won't, I'll speak from the eye, mm-hmm. that this global pandemic would bring us together, right? Like that yeah. it offers us empathy for the other and like that we've learned something from it. And it feels like that's that hasn't happened at all. Like, what was the point of this? What was the point of, of going through this together if it wasn't going to, to bring us together? I just feel that they're going to die crutching their Le Crusade pans, my dear. That's just what I feel that they, and I'm like, some people are just going to, that's just, they're going to be calcified with their things, you know, like that's, they're going to be solidified 
in their obsession with things over people, over empathy, over, I'm like you, and I love a Le Creuset pan. I'm going to go chef it up in just a moment. <laughs> but like things over people is a very, when I look at this whole election, I'm like, things are people and these people yes. are choosing things and over themselves because they're going to get yes. sick. I'm worried yeah. about Black Friday. That's what I'm going to say. We about to, mm. we about to watch people show their ass. Capitalism is about to be, the, they about to laugh at us, baby. Because they about to be in them stores, in them lines, running each other over, mask on, and they're going to let it happen. It's about to be crazy because people so pent up. And I'm like, y'all really finna go elbow each other like uh, WWE wrestlers over TVs in a yeah, pandemic. If, if anyone's out there listening and you're still participating <laughs> in something called Black Friday, first I'm off, weak. go look up the origin of that name. Second, no. Like, no, right? Like, come on, guys. We're better than that. We're better than that. We can, like, get our savings in other places. We don't need to participate in that mass consumption in that way, I think. When I lived in Spain, there were only, like, a handful of Black people that were in my grad program. So, of course, we all did that thing where you, like, just lock eyes and you're like, <laughs> you need anything? I got you. Right? right? And so we were, yeah, like, it's me and you. So we were in grad school. Yeah, for sure. So we did that, like, link up thing on the first day. And then we let our social relationships build. But it was Black Friday. And I just remember we were walking through the streets, like me and like three other black students in my grad program walking to class and Spaniards were poking their head out their doors and they were like putting up the black power fist. Like they were going, hey, <laughs> and like waving their fists. Was that and being endearing like, or were you like, what is happening here? Like, what, I was what, confused what was like? because I had it. I was confused because right. I didn't know why they were doing it until I saw a store and it was a glasses store. Mm -hmm. And a photo of a woman, black girl, with like big glasses and a big afro. And uh -huh. it was like, Black Friday discounts. No, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you guys think that this is about black power. Like, oh. I, they were so happy. That's like, really sweet. Was, I, like, when you think about it that way. I was like, <laughs> I was like, first of all, y'all are racist. Because they got all the little racist candies with the, with the black face. Yeah, Europe is... The, oh, yeah, no, like, hi, they started it. Yeah. They started it. Okay, like, <laughs> the amount of times that I was in a taxi in Spain, and I'm speaking Spanish because I speak Spanish pretty well, and so they would assume that I was from Equatorial Guinea because there's a lot of... It's the only African nation where they speak Spanish. Wow. So people would go, are you from Guinea? And we talk in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I go, no, I'm American. And they'd be like, what? No, you're not. And I'd be like, so I would just start speaking in English. And they'd be like, oh my like, God, you're American. <laughs> and I'd be like, like, yeah. And they'd be like, but like, where are you from? And I'd be like, America. And they'd be like, before that. And I'd be like, Ohio, Georgia. And they'd be like, but before that, like, are you African? And I'd be like, now stop acting like, now come on now. Ugh. Now come on. Now you know good and damn well what's going on here. Right. Stop right. acting stupid. Right. <laughs> like, you're the answer. Stop. You did it. Yeah. Like but that yeah. Black Friday is every time I think of Black Friday, I laugh. And to the other <laughs> black kids, I text them on Black Friday. Like we all text like with a little black power <laughs> fist, like, hey girl, I, we really had to explain it. They were like clapping. And then <laughs> Oh my god, what a like lost in translation moment. Like, oh, also just American Americanism everywhere, just like overflow. Like, yeah, yeah, they were so confused, and I was like, <laughs> "Not these discounts!" Like, it's yeah. not. We, we didn't know. No, it's not about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Yeah, and we had to sit and explain. Like, it's not oh. about black power and unity, but that's very cute, and I love that you think that. That's not it. Oh, so yeah, no, every time I think about that, I'm like, oh, like. They were so happy to see us. And I didn't understand why. They were like, yes! <laughs> I, and I like I was only on that day. Like, that they wouldn't just, like, that only on that day they would acknowledge, you know, For your sure. existence. You no, know, we in never that had way. fans like that before. We walked that same route <laughs> to school. They're like, That's oh, oh yeah, today's the one day that we can yes. <laughs> support them. There we go. Yes. Um, great. This ends at midnight. Today's their day. <laughs> For sure, they were like, it's your day. How do you feel? That's like my college used to do fried chicken on Fridays for Black History Month. No. Oh, oh. my God. Oh, yeah. Really? The, out of, the out of touch white oh thing that happened my in my heart. Yeah. Fried chicken Fridays. No. Yeah. <laughs> 
that's so racist. <laughs> like that is so blatantly <laughs> racist. And they would Whoa. have like soul food, and it would be like half ass soul food. It was bad. Oh my god, it was so bad. Oh. That wasn't in Spain. That was in America. But you know, yeah, like, that was obviously fried. in America. Like to- most tone deaf <laughs> place ever. Jesus. And they were so proud. Bless them. They were like, for Black History Month, we'll be doing soul food Sundays. We won't be adding any more Black trustees to the school based on <laughs> Black music, nor will we be providing funding for Black people to attend our school based on Black music. But you can't have fried but you can pay for dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you can have fried chicken Fridays oh and tasteless God. mac and cheese. You know, oh. that's, you know, it's interesting for sure. There's still a lot of work to do. Well, we are certainly better off. We are, a lot uh, of work to do. We're better off, but there's a lot to be done. And so I felt yeah. hopeful and optimistic, but I also was like, oh, well, you know, we, they might fry chicken Fridays us with the police reform child. They're going to be wearing kente cloth. The prisoner's going to get fried chicken oh Fridays. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> the kente cloth. That was a nightmare. The kente cloth that jump was suits. A nightmare. <laughs> oh, the, yay, yay. It was dystopian. Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> And that was the weird, that image, like, of all of them <laughs> kneeling, like, and I, it was so weird. Yeah. I was like, they said Wakanda forever. Yeah. <laughs> and what? then Black oh, Panther weird, died. Weird. Well, it oh, happened, and then, like, Black Panther died. And I was like, not them kneeling, doing the Black Panther <laughs> salute. And then here's Chadwick Boseman, like, becoming an elevated ancestor. But, mm. yeah, the Kente cloth, I hope that they put that in. I want to show my grandchildren. And if I live to be an ancestor. I'm gonna come back and be like, look at this bullshit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that needs to go in like the yearbook of 2020 fucked upness. And it's like, look, look at, at all the all of Donald Trump's tweets, and then like this weird shit that happened. It was they were a like, wild year. It was weird. It was like, and we're just going to kneel. <laughs> we're kneeling in kente cloth for George Damn. Floyd. Like I, whoever came up with that idea was like, I've got the best. <laughs> And like, you know, that they also floated a bunch of other ideas and that was the best one that they came up with. Like that was their discernment was like, yes, yes, yes. That was their discernment. (laughs) And so you see some things and you go, that's what you thought. Right. That That was was what you thought was the best option. That one right there. Like, oh, wow. wow. (laughs) <laughs> no I remember looking again I woke up and looked at the news and I sent the photo to my friends and I was like is this real like they photoshopped this it was the, the in the gra- and they were like graduation kentes like I wore yeah. a kente like that when I graduated <laughs> that it was so like I was like do you have an Africana studies degree Nancy Pelosi uh, like did you, <laughs> you pledge uh, HP, you know, like right, right. So, are you a fraternity? Like, are you finna start stepping? Like, what's about to go <laughs> on here? It was all too much. Yikes! You what know. A, well, I want to frame the- that. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a really good year of memes. I will say that. Like the the meme the meme content is just it, it keeps coming. Oh, excellent! Because you got to <laughs> laugh through the pain, right? Like the humor this year has been on ten, right, right? And we're all in the house on social media, right? We're all comedians now. We all oh, are yeah. like <laughs> everyone's hilarious because we're drunk all day. We're drunk at nine a.m. tweeting <laughs> mimosas and tweeting. Do you see this? Wakanda oh. forever. <laughs> what a time. What a time. Speaking of time, I've taken way too much of your time. I'm oh, thank so you for having grateful me. for just that we got to have this conversation. You're a delight. And how can people find you and work with you and support everything that you do? Because you're truly a blessing. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. No, this was super fun. So you can always find me at satara.com, S-A-T-A-R-R-A.com. And that's where you'll find like product drops. If you want like Florida water, come to me oil or better business oil. My divination books are currently booked through 2021 through like May. Yes, she is. is. We love to see it. We love to see it. We will ship that. Yes, we're here for that. (laughs) But because it's so far out, that's as far out as I can plan responsibly. So I just always tell people, if you're looking for a reading, join the mailing list. I'm doing this thing because people ask me about a waiting list and I'm firmly anti-waiting list. If somebody misses mm-hmm. their appointment, I take a nap. 
So there is no waiting list. Yeah, no. And you take their money if they, if they miss the appointment because they miss the appointment. No, we can say this right here. There are no refunds for missed appointments. No. No. no, that's on you. If you missed your appointment, my therapist wouldn't be like, yeah, no, don't worry about it. I'd still have to pay my therapist if I missed an appointment. Absolutely. And I'm going to take the nap and be richer. Yeah. <laughs> that's what's gonna happen great. it's great <laughs> but there's no waiting list but I do say get on the email list because when I open that's where you find out and it goes out I have a patreon so if you want to be on the patreon and you want more info about patreon and you want to support me monthly that's good and you get the perk of finding out about product drops first nice. and it's been interesting because the patreon has grown now and like I open divination spots and personal coaching spots and they took them all before I really even opened it to the public. You got to get on that VIP list guys. So now y'all got to be, you got to be in the exclusive spaces for real. Because one thing about the Patreon homies, I was like, Oh, y'all not playing. They said, I'm saving my card info for real. (laughs) They said I'm creating an account. Hey, that's what happens when you're a patron. When you support, when yeah, when you support people in their work consistently, they'll support you back, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what you're doing for them. So I love that. I think that's awesome. Yeah, and honoring that Patreon's probably the place to get everything first. Cool. But there are all all the other ways, and then Instagram. If you want to just see me be out here tweeting and Twitter, you're hilarious. And Twitter, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Hashtag number one Conjure Coochie on Twitter. <laughs> I changed it. Yeah, that's my Twitter name. So that's me. <laughs> that is Chef's Kiss amazing. That's perfect. <laughs> that's where you can find me. But thank okay. you for having me. Oh my God. It was such a joy. I am obsessed with you and uh, I like love everything that you do and your work and you're brilliant. So thank you for gracing us with your presence. <laughs>